So here's the question you got to ask when a teacher tells you to put your phone away and pay attention. Here's your response and you tell me if from what you know of psychology this response is accurate. Sorry teacher, it is developmentally appropriate for me to constantly check what my friends are doing. Is that true? More so for the girls as far as brain, here's the theory, brain wiring, the female brain is more social according to evolutionary theory because female brains were wired for a slightly different person, that, that have a different purpose than male brains. Nothing in nature is by accident. So if females and males are different, they have to serve a different purpose. Males. Do you think males more often use their phone for games? And do you think females more often use their phone for social connections? That's the theory. Take it for what it is. It could be complete crap. I don't know if anyone's done any data on it, but if you were to match technology and social media with the evolutionary theory of the female brain and why it's wired the way it is, maybe, just maybe, there's a relationship. All right. We know what's due. We know when it's due. Say yes. All right. So here's the deal. <clears throat> the question we have for today is do you want to know your IQ? Who wants to take an IQ test on Friday? Who does not? All right, who did not raise their hand? Good job, why? Well, just because you're lazy? Now, interesting, did you guys see that? The two twins, when one raised their hand, the other raised their hand, at the exact same time. Do that again. Whoa, all right, so here's I, you're the same person, like Batman and Bruce Wayne. So here's the way it, look, here's the way it works. Um, have you guys ever been walking in our school and then you see two ugly kids kissing and you're like, oh, put that away. It's not right, like what, what is like two snails? I know, what I'm saying. <laughs> So here's the deal. And you can't, it like haunts you for the rest of the day. You can't unsee it. One of the things about knowledge, and we touched upon in psychology, they say one of the things about intelligence is to possess knowledge. So we touched upon what is knowledge. The one thing I do know about knowledge is you cannot purposely get rid of it. You don't believe me? Try to forget your phone number. So once you see two ugly people kissing, you can't get rid of that. You have to be careful what knowledge you want to seek. Because once you have it, it's yours. Many of you all have this idea, this self-concept, that you can do anything you want if you just put your mind to it. You work hard enough, the world is yours. You can overcome anything. What if you find out that's not true? What if you find out you do not have the genetic horsepower to make your dreams? You do not have the intellectual material to do it. Everyone here is thinking, you know, bachelor's degree, grad degree, maybe professional degree, doctor, lawyer professional engineer, you want to pull out some bank, you want to have some prestige in our society. What if you find out you're significantly below average? What are you going to do with that? If I've done math and I know which way the less than and the, the more than alligator symbols are, <laughs> half of you know, half of you are below average in this class. Do you want to find that out? Or are you happy in your ignorance? I've never taken an intelligence test. Or actually, well, I can't tell you. All right, we'll talk about that in a little bit, how it ended badly, and there was a messy incident involving the police. Go ahead. Louder! Guy, you're not ready. You're not ready. For what? What's that? You know what? In my house, I don't sleep. And I'll tell you what I do. I just hide behind a different corner every night. Oh, I'm ready. Go ahead. Yes. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but I'll tell you how not to do it. I would imagine that most of your parents, let's say they're late 40s, their 50s, what do they do to challenge themselves? What do they do to make their brain grow? Do they? My mom does. Okay, good. We got a couple. Now, I don't know about the long-term longitudinal data effects of luminosity or brain training or something like that, but I would suspect most Americans, if the Simpsons are a satirical reflection of the American society. And most people are like Homer and Marge. They go through the same routine every day. What do they do to foster neuroplasticity? If you don't stress yourself, your brain won't grow. So can you get a higher IQ? Yes. But that goes back to our warm-up question from yesterday. We introduced the unit. Why do you want one? What's it going to do for you? Will it improve your life? Will it make you more money? Will it make you happier? Is it bragging rights? So the question we have to ask is, why do you want it? Or no, first, do you want to know and why? I had one kid, and she is in this classroom. She goes, I just want to know. I don't really care about it. I just want to know. So here's the question. Not to pick on that kid, Amy. 
Not to pick on that kid too much, but she represents a lot of people. I just want to know. I'm just curious. I got to call BS on that because an IQ test takes time. It's effort. Have you ever taken the SAT? You're drained after it. So if you're working real hard, you got to spend the money. You got to spend time. You're not going to do that unless that thing means something to you. So if you get a good result, you're like, I knew it. Counselors were right. <laughs> if you get a bad result, watch the cognitive dissonance that will play. You get a bad result, like, well, that stuff doesn't mean anything. If it didn't mean anything, if you didn't believe in it, why'd you spend the time and money in the first place? Hmm. A lot of you have dreams and hopes. It's probably the most personal thing. If I were to say, what do you really dream about? What is your goal for the future? You would have trouble sharing that. You might rather share your crush, who you have a crush on, than share what you really want out of life. What if you find out that it's probably not going to happen and intellectually? Do you really want to know? Would it be ethical for a teacher, a high school teacher, to give students an IQ test and just give them the results? Are you ready for that information? Just be careful what you ask for. Just be careful. It reminds me of this joke. It's a dirty joke. You guys ready for this? Never mind, I won't say it. Notice how easily you were tricked into wanting something that might offend you. <laughs> Notice how easy, like, oh, let me know, let me know. Be careful what you want to know. Be careful what you want to know. All right, so on your market set, let's talk about standardization. I think I showed you the Seinfeld video where George hired Elaine or paid Elaine to take the IQ test for him. This, no, I didn't. You've seen, all right, maybe I'll throw out that Seinfeld uh, episode towards the end of class. The idea is maybe this is why you should not take uh, an IQ test at home because you're gonna open up another window, you're gonna Google, you're gonna do this. IQ tests need to be taken in a certain environment. And look, the less uh, bias and confounding variables, we talk about the more experimental control. Ultimately, an IQ test is an experiment. Get rid of all variables. We have an if, it's the independent variable. We have a then, which is the dependent variable. If you take the test this way, then you will have the right results. If you don't take it this way, you won't have the right results. We're going to talk about norms in a little bit when we get to um, Z-scores. We talk about what is the average IQ and what is genius and what is, and again, I use this word clinically appropriately, please no giggles, what is retarded. And then inter-rater reliability. Here's the way I'm going to introduce inter-rater reliability. Let's talk about a clinician. Let's talk about a therapist. You go to a therapist, Mrs. Schmidlap, Dr. Hoosie, what's it? And you say, hey, I've got these symptoms. And she says, you have depression. You go to Dr. Felderspar. You say, hey, I've got these symptoms. And she gives you a totally different diagnosis than the first doctor. Is it, which, one's, which one's reliable? Or, and they've done this a lot, if they're going to test the diagnose, diagnostic ability of different clinicians, you have a couple people. And you go in one or two months apart, a couple different actors, and they give the uh, therapist a different set or the same set of symptoms. If the therapist gives a different diagnosis to each client who present the same symptoms, what does that mean? And we're going to get, that's kind of foreshadowing. In a later unit, we get to abnormal psych. What is abnormal? Who decides, and are, is the decision reliable, and is the decision valid? You ever been to a, a doctor, you got sore throat, they give you medicine, it doesn't work? They give you another medicine, it doesn't work? They can't find out what's wrong with you? How do we know that doesn't happen in psychology? When we talk about reliability, please know that young children's scores are not very reliable. Little Susie Hoosie, what's it? Five years old, she's smart. They give her an IQ test. She scores off the charts. Six months later, she's in the back eating paste, wiping her nose with her hem of her skirt. What does this mean? There's a lot of, lot of fluctuation in childhood. Hormonally, brain structure, socially, emotionally, there's a lot of things going on. However, Teenage and adult scores are reliable. Just so you know, if you, see a, uh, the, uh, if you see an abbreviation R, and we'll get to N for sample size, it's generally going to be italicized. So you see an italicized R equals 90%. So the correlational value between your IQ score, if you're 17 and 27, 90% chance, pretty similar. Can you get it better? Yeah. But remember, in your 20s, what's your number one job? Is it to find a mate? or is it to start building your career, or both. It's darn sure not to build your brain, increase your IQ score. I wonder, if you go to match.com, 
All right. Do they have an IQ slot? Should they? Would you want someone smarter than you? Would you want someone dumber than you? So let's move on with this. Um, so here's the big question we have. Do IQ tests actually measure intelligence or do they measure how well you do on IQ tests? I've had a lot of people, they just measure how well you can do on tests. And I look at them, you didn't do well, did you? Like, no. <laughs> so what we really need to look at is operationalization. What are we really defining with an IQ test? Are we defining that if you do well on an, I, an IQ test measures your ability to be happy, get a lot of money, do calculus problems in your head? How do we operationalize intelligence? We, we know the problem with operationalizing emotion. How do we operationalize love, number of hugs, sadness, volume of tears? So we gotta make this thing tangible, something we can touch, something we can see, something we can measure. And that's tough to do. So interwoven in this chapter are a whole bunch of rhetorical questions. Let's say that IQ tests are fair. Let's say they're reliable. Let's say they're valid. What do we do with it? I didn't say they're useful. If a young child is shown to have low IQ, low IQ, should we waste educational research resources on her? That's kind of harsh. Was Galton right? Sir Francis Galton said, like it or not, all people are not created equal. We have different abilities. You and I both know it. There are people in the school that get lost, I, I don't know, in an elevator. There are people in the school that have trouble walking and texting. <laughs> Elevators have two doors, you don't know, it gets confusing. It's kind of harsh. We only have a finite amount of tax dollars. Should we treat all people the same? Or should we say, look, this kid's got some real talent. Let's give them one-on-one -on -one with the teacher, and let's see if this might be the one who's going to solve the common cold, if this one can take the salt out of the water. So, or... Should we give her every resource? What do we do? And I don't think our society knows. We're scared about that because at our heart, we really want to believe all people are equal and all people deserve the same chances. Did I threaten you all with an extra credit project? Do you want one? Design an intelligence test. Notice that many of you all would jump immediately into, all right, multiple choice, what would I ask? Because I think you were literate. You read well. You're used to tests. That's what you're accustomed to. That's your culture. Some of you even wait for it. <laughs> read for pleasure. So I wonder if your test will be designed pretty much verbally. Could you make an intelligence test out of a video game? How about a Rubik's Cube with only two colors? How about a Rubik's Cube with no corners? What if I gave you an, a, a paper clip and I said, the intelligence test, I'm going to operationalize it. You are really smart if you can come up with 20 useful uses for a paperclip. If you were to make an intelligence test, would you make a PowerPoint? Would you make it out of clay? Would you get a bunch of Jenga blocks? What would you do? How would you even conceptualize this? That's a pretty wild thing. Or would it, multiple choice, essay, some math questions. Something to think about. OK, look. <clears throat> If psychology is to be a science, and I've introduced, there might be a debate because some people say psychology is too squishy, too touchy-feely, too based on opinion and projective test. If psychology is to be a science, we want to reduce it. We need a number. Let's reduce it to this. If we have an IQ point, a number, 100, 105, 130, or 78, you think that's correlated to the number of synapses you have in your prefrontal cortex? Hmm. Can we reduce brain, who you are, your personality, to how many synapses you have and where they are? So the idea of science is reductionist, but you and I both know the more you reduce, the kind of, you lose what it is. You cannot reduce a human being, their creativity, to a number, hopefully a three-digit number, not a two-digit number. This is something that's really important. The history of psychology has oftentimes given us the idea that intelligence is concrete. It's genetic. There's no argument. Gifted pro athletes, the reason that way is genetic. I'll never be that good. And I'm not saying there's not a genetic component. You and I both know that no one in this class has what it takes 
to be an NFL star. Sorry, some girl's like, really? <laughs> Sorry, hate to ruin it. And I'm just not sure any one of us is going to be a model. So <laughs> that's not right. So you need, you, there is going to be a genetic component. But please, please, please do not think that genes are written in stone. We know that genes can be switched on and off because of environmental factors. What if we said this? IQ score is like a snapshot from a point of your life. Do any one of you all have like awkward portraits and pictures of you as a child somewhere around your house? Do you have them going up the stairs of you and your brothers and sisters, something like that? And like, oh, mom. And your mom's like, no, I love it. So the reality, is that who you really are? No, I don't think so. Ideally, you've taken better pictures of it. Notice, notice, notice of your profile pics. You pick the best one, don't you? You crop out all your friends or brothers and sisters. You get your little thing, put it on in there. <laughs> who you are is not a snapshot. And I don't know that your intelligence can be reducible to one result over one time. I'm not saying it's not valid. I'm not saying it's not accurate. I'm not saying it's not valid. But be careful of reducing it too much. What if you work really hard to change your image? or your IQ test, neuroplasticity, genetic plasticity. The word we've introduced before, it is worth writing down for you, is going to be what's called epigenetics. Epigenetics is the science or the discipline or the new academic and new, relatively new, of studying how the environment can affect someone's genes. How the environment can affect someone's genes. So, what if you had person or participant or subject A and they were really, really, really stressed for a long period of time and that switched on certain genes and switched off certain genes and then that person mated? Will their offspring be affected by the environment of their parents? Yeah. One more time. Intelligence was and still is thought to be a genetic gift like athletic ability, like musical talent. And I talked about singing in this class, how American Idol never, ever lets me, lets me get in there, never returns my call. <laughs> and I, you're laughing. I share so much and you mock. You don't know that I've waited hours at those big stadiums trying to weave through, waiting for my number to be called. <laughs> but I think American Idol and I think The Voice do a really bad service because all they focus on is talent, talent, talent. How often, if you watch American Idol, if you watch The Voice, if you watch America's Got Talent, notice the show does not say America's got people that work their butt off for years to get where they are. That's a strange thing in our reality TV show world. I think intelligence is probably we should focus on what are you, are you using everything you have instead of should you want more. All right, we got to talk about Benet and Simon. Write them both down. They're important. Double highlight Benet's last name. Double highlight Benet's last name. We're going to credit them with the first modern intelligence test. And it wasn't for psychology, because you and I both know psychology was so young yet, it, hasn't kind of, it hadn't spread out, it hadn't marinated the rest of the academic world. It was still kind of a fringe idea. So Benet and Simon, they wanted to measure children's aptitude. What do you think French school children could do? Not all kids are created equal. So how do we teach them best? Some people need extra instruction. Some people barely need the teacher talking. Uh, teacher, shut up. I've got this. You don't need to over explain for 47 straight minutes. I got it in the first five. And other people are like, can you, can you say that again? Can you explain it again? Because we've got different abilities. They were part of educational reforms. You don't need to know that, you know, it's not trivia day. What you do need to know is this bullet point. This is crucial. And you know what? I'm going to give you extra credit because my teacher gave me extra credit. When something was important back in the day, I whipped out a tattoo gun. I wrote it right on my arm. That's how committed I was to learning. And I don't see that commitment out of you. I don't see that. Now, twins, you get half credit if you write it on the other person, because theoretically you feel the other person's pain. Go ahead. Can I see it? Can you see the tattoo? Yeah. No. Why do you think I got nothing but sleeves, brother? <laughs> nothing but sleeves. You don't know that slowly I'm tattooing myself with invisible ink? I'll sit here and ask other random things. If everything in the world was invisible, would you be blind? 
I've never seen you think so much. You don't give a flip in anything about this. If you're going in a spaceship at the speed of light and you turn your headlights on, what happens? I know. This is some scary crap. Would you run into them? All right, so what the what? Let's talk about mental age. What can a three-year-old, what is an average three-year-old supposed to be able to do? Say twinkle, twinkle, little star. Okay, does a three-year-old have a certain amount of vocabulary words the average three-year-old should know? Should a five-year-old be able to tie their shoe? Should an eight-year-old be able to swim the length of a pool? Should a 10-year-old be able to bike around their neighborhood and not get lost? So you compare what a child should do, mental age, with their real age, chronological age is how old they actually are. This gives us a ratio. You're comparing one thing to the other. No ratio IQ, because in a minute, I'm going to ask you to write something. And I want you, you won't do it, because I think you're scared. You're a little intimidated by the corporation of Mead, who makes all of your loose leaf paper. They've confined you to lines. I'm saying break free. So here we go. This calculation, three lines high. Mental age divided by chronological age times 100 equal IQ. Make that three lines high. Break free of your lines. Think outside the box. Cast off the chains of mediocrity. <laughs> this is why I'm not allowed to speak in public. Here's what I find funny about you sneaking food. Is you have the bag on your desk. So I see you reach into the bag, but then you put it down below and then sneak it. So check it out. I need a volunteer. Who am I going to pick on the most? Simran. Thank you. All right then, young lady. How old are you? 16. 16. Okay, so check this out. We're going to pick on you a little bit. Hold on, little trivia question, boys and girls. What's the average IQ? Anyone know? Who said 100? You're right. That's two in a row. You got yourself a line. You don't believe me? One right answer, two right answer, you got a line. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what we're looking at. 16 years old. That's your chronological age. Now we've got to determine your mental age. Do you have a driver's license? What is the number one task a 16-year-old in our society is supposed to have? Good job. All right, so here's what we're looking at. <laughs> 15 divided by 6. Well, get your calculators out. You got your phone on your desk anyway. Put it to some use and try to do this for me. What is 15 divided by 16 times 100? That is going to equal her IQ. Serious? Serious is a heart attack. That's pretty serious. What do you got? If she did have her license, well... She's 16 years old, can do all the tasks of 16 year old times 100. She has an IQ of 100. That's not right. Why not? Who said that's not right? Do you have a driver's license? Wait, what? Someone said that's not right, and I suspect the person that yeah. says it's not right doesn't have a driver's license. No, I have a license. Have you crashed yet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, we can see there are some problems with this, but this is, uh, is kind of how it began. Notice we talk about IQ, it's a quotient. You remember that if you multiply two things, you get a product. You add two things, you get a sum. You uh, uh, subtract things, you get a difference, you divide, you get a quotient. So you got little Tommy Thompson, 10 years old. 10 year olds are supposed to be able to have a vocabulary of this. Maybe they're supposed to be able to do this many math facts in their head. Maybe they're supposed to be able to, I don't know, ride their bike, tie their shoe, whatever. However, Tommy Thompson can only do the things that an eight-year-old can do. You can do the math. Eight divided by 10 times 100 equals Tommy's got an IQ of 80. You got a 10-year-old. They can do all the things of a 12-year-old. You can do the math. So this works really well for children. This doesn't necessarily work well for adults. This is great for kids because there's a, there's a difference between a six-year-old and a seven-year-old. There's a difference between a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. But I don't know if there's a difference between a 37-year-old and a 39-year-old. A 64-year-old and a 65-year-old. What's a 65-year-old supposed to be able to do that a 64-year-old can't do? You can see that breaks down as people get older. The other criticism of this, the first criticism is it's good for children, not for adults. The other criticism of this is it's too verbal. 
This is a written test, written by educators. And you and I both know there's some people that might not speak too good. <laughs> You'll get that. So what do we, the concept here is, what if we could switch it? How do we know there's not a clay forming intelligence? Why don't we make an intelligence test with a, anyone ever play, uh, what's the board game? Is it categories or where you have to like either draw, make something out of clay? Is it, it's Pictionary, but there's more to Pictionary. Cranium? Okay. So what, do we, what I'm saying is why would we only have one what's called modality? And that's the problem here, one modality. Some people say teachers. You know that I only teach one way I talk. Would you all want me to give you a bunch of worksheets? Should we get in groups? Should I do this? Instead of giving you a quiz at the end of the class where you type into your phone, should I have corner A, B, C, D? And if you think their answer is right, you have to walk across. So you stand A, you stand to B. Would you like that idea? Some people think that's going to stimulate a different type of learning because you're using your body and not just sitting still. Different modalities. Do they have some effect? Maybe. You got to know Terman's name. What time, how much time we got? We got time. Oh, quit your crying. When I was growing up, we didn't have time. Things all happened at once. Lewis Terman of Stanford University. You got to know him. Actually, you got to know Stanford. All right, instead of ratio IQ, we're going to talk about deviation IQ. Deviation IQ is we're going to deviate from the norm. You can see a bell curve coming. You can almost smell a bell curve coming because we know mean is 100. How much do you deviate? What is the average deviation? Or what if I say it this way, instead of average deviation, what is the standard deviation of a group of people? How far do you deviate from the norm? Let's not write this down, but let's do this. Let's talk about this. <clears throat> instead of comparing age versus what you should be able to do, let's take 1,000 adults. Let's give them an intelligence test. We know there's going to be some variability. That's going to be a stat word we're going to come up with. This unit is particularly intertwined with stats. We know there's going to be variability. Some people are going to not do well. Some people are going to rock it and do really awesome. They're a freaking boss. Most people are going to be in the middle. So instead of compare, it doesn't matter how old they are, compare, it gets compare how well they did. What we're going to basically find out is let's start to make a histogram. And we're going to have ourselves a little line. We're going to have this low performers. We're going to have this high performers. We're going to have this normal. We're going to find out, of course, you get one person, two person, three person, four person. You're going to have, of that thousand people, oh, I don't know, maybe 68% are going to fall really close to normal. You're not going to have a lot of people way out here. You're not going to have a lot of people way out here. And what you're eventually going to have is, of course, a bell curve. So what are we doing with this? We are comparing your IQ against a huge data set. If you score a lot higher than everyone else, we got two options. Either you're really smart, or the test is complete crap and it's really easy. But if not a lot of people can score this high, then we kind of assume the test is valid, and that means you're really smart. If you're not scoring way up here, well, guess what? Does that mean you're not really smart, or does that just mean you didn't do well? are the two things the same. Do you get the difference between deviation and ratio? Okay. You have a choice. You either say, yes, I understand and get to watch a video, or I will keep teaching. Let's practice. Do you understand the difference between ratio and deviation IQ? Yes. Video time. That's teaching. We're going to have con, like my daddy, all right, or pro. <laughs> I'm so down to hell. Is that my soul I smell burning? All right, well, here we go. 